good day and welcome back so we're talking about closure in this section and don't worry I did say like three videos ago that we were really close to getting out of this chapter chapter 5 on JavaScript trust me I think there's like one more video I'm gonna do in JavaScript and then we'll be out of it all right so let's get into it so what is closure or what are closures um, so I pulled the first one from the JavaScript um, um, MSDN developers network um, definition and page and it says a function that refers to independent or free variable in other words a function defined in the closure remembers the environment that it was created I'll say this um, that's one way and that's totally true but I'd say it's a function which continues to refer to a variable after the scope in which the um, variable was created expires and I'll try and show you that just now. Um, so hopefully between the two definitions, you could kind of get a feel for what it is. It's basically being able to have a function that access, access to variables um, somewhere else that were defined somewhere else, okay? You know, not an environment as they put it in the first case, or scope, if you like. So let's see some details. Okay, so a couple of videos back, we talk about scopes. We said that there's global scope, you always have the global scope regardless of which environment you're in, whether it's a web browser or a Node.js environment, you always have a global scope and it also comes with some variables. Now I'm leaving those variables out like console and you know underscore, underscore directory or whatever. That, those are not important here. What I'm trying to say is that we have this scope called um, global scope and then I'm trying to put in the variables. I know variables are going to be defined in the different scopes, but I'm trying to put it to the side for illustration because I want to show you what's happening with the variable as you go through different scopes. And keep in mind that we talk about this when we talk about scope a couple of videos back, that a function introduces its own variable scope, okay? So, all right, let's see what's going on here um, with closures. So let's assume that in my global scope, you know, I'm, I'm going to define a function. So because I have to start somewhere, this function foo is going to be added to my global scope. And so the function is pretty simple. And again, function introduces its own scope. So essentially, it creates a variable um, this function when run creates a variable called x5. Now the function definition says creates a variable. Remember the variable is not created there until you actually run the function. So I run this function and this purple represents the scope of that function call and so basically it creates a scope and the function uh, and the variable x is, gets defined to be 5. Alright, so so far so good. Nothing magical there. Let's see what happens if I introduce something else? In the definition we saw earlier of a closure, it says it's a function which holds on to the definition of a variable defined somewhere else. So within the scope of foo, I'm gonna create another function called goo. And goo, look what it's doing. It says log the value of x, you know, print it out. And so I'm not even going to run goo inside of foo where it's defined. I just define it in, in, in foo. I'm actually going to return a reference or a handle to that function that I just defined goo. So if you imagine when you run the function foo, it creates the variable x, and then it returns a reference to that function foo, and there I store it in the variable g, right? See, is what's happening here? Now, so far, there's nothing strange going on because we've seen before that function in JavaScript, you can create functions within functions and so on, okay? And so, there we go. We created a function inside of another function. And here, instead of running it, though, I return a reference to it. Now that I have a reference to that function in um, G, now I can say G call, call that function goo, but using the reference G. And so what I should expect should happen if I was looking at a console is that it should print out um, the value of x also. But look at this. If I said that how, you know, x was declared in the scope uh, introduced by foo, once foo returns, which is when it returns an handle to g, well then that variable x should be destroyed. So later on, even though you have an handle to goo, when I call goo, it should be like, hey, I don't know where x is because it's gone. I mean, the function that created it, foo, doesn't exist anymore and it's not running or whatever. But that's not what happens. You can actually see if we run the code and we'll see just now that it actually prints out, able to print out this. And this is what I mean by closure because 
um, you can say that GU closes over the variable X. It somehow in encapsulated in a way, remembers it. And so the way it does this without getting too technical, it maintains a reference to it. Uh, but I'll get back to that. So let's look at some code and actually see this work first. And then we'll talk about some details. So that's going to be in the scene. So the example is pretty much the exact same thing I showed before, except that I had a little string in front of it. But um, the idea is still the same, right? Foo introduces a variable at line 2 and creates a variable line 2. And then cre um, it creates a function or defines a function at line 4 called go. I return that function on line eight, but the function is never, Gu is never run inside of foo itself. That is when foo is running the function, Gu is not running, all right? That's the important thing. They run at different times. And so now I can invoke foo, get the definition of Gu, a reference to it. And now I can run Gu later indirectly using G and I do get the result of X, even though the function foo is ended. And that is because you can say goo closes over the value x. So any value that goo references, even though it introduces its own scope, now I didn't create any value inside of goo, but I could, any variable, sorry, inside of goo, but I could, it introduces its own scope. If I said var x, I would, have over, I would have shadowed the x that it's in foo, but that's not what I did. I just used refortrate, and to know goo closes over, encapsulate, and still references the value at the variable x, even though that function no longer exists. And so let's see what's going on. Remember I mentioned this whole idea of reference and uh, reference content as something going on in the NSC? Let me see if I could try and explain it to you, just to give you a little bit of um, background. If you don't quite get it, don't worry too much, okay? This is not going to be any exam, so don't worry. So this is sort of what's going on in the background. When I create the function, define the function foo, again, we said no variable is actually created until you run it. So when I run it, um, the function by itself, the way it is, you could say the variable x comes into existence, get the value 5, and you can say that all, what a computer is doing is also keeping a reference count. Basically, how many people are referring to this variable, how many people are using it, or, you know, people, but how many pieces of code um, functions, things with their own scope are using it. And so it says, ah, it's coming into existence, somebody's using it, so the count is 1. Great. What next? Well, the function ends and then eventually it's not using that uh, variable and the count goes to zero and then it's cleaned up. I'm not going to worry too much about telling you how it's cleaned up. We're not going to talk about that much in JavaScript. Now, what happens when you have a closure, as in the example here with foo and go? So again, the function is defined, foo, to include you know, all the stuff that you see there. And then you run it. And again, the variable x is created and gets the value 5. And because there's also a function there um, that gets defined and also refers to that variable, the reference count is increased one more, so the reference count is actually 2 by the time you reach the end of the function foo. So when you return and, um, from the function foo, goo, also holds a reference to this variable in addition to foo and the reference count is two. You can imagine that if foo goes out of existence, um, then the reference count is down to one and the variable still exists. The system cannot clean it up because there's still somebody else holding a reference to it and that somebody is goo or the, the, the definition that represents goo, okay? And we have a reference to that definition in the form of g and so in the variable g. So, so long as we have the variable g, this variable x will still be kept alive because there's something that has a reference to it. A reference count would still be equals to one. And so now when we call g, int it could still print out the value of five because, or, or of x in, in fact, because um, it, had, it maintains a reference to it. So example two is a little bit more involved. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so here, what we're looking at is basically the same function, but I want to show you that every time you run a function, which I know you know, every time you run a function, it, of course, must start over, right? So you wouldn't want that you run foo once and it maintain the same values from the previous time if you run it a second time, right? Um, that would sort of would 
um, be counterintuitive to what you expect when you run a function, you get the same result every single time. So I kind of want to prove that here. So each time I call foo, I'm going to give it a string. And that string is also going to be enclosed by the inner function gu. So not only is gu enclosing x, which was you know, defined in foo, but it's enclosing something that's actually passed into foo. Before this get too complex um, and too much for you to wrap your mind around, let's just go to the illustration and see if that's going to help us grasp what's going on here with the two variables that are being passed into the two different function calls. Okay, so let's see if we can wrap our heads around what's going on here. So the function definition is just as you saw in the code. And here, to remind you, it's just uh, that goo is being wrapped around two variables. A reference has been passed in its name and the variable x defined in foo. Now, that's not nothing really new, unless you think it's interesting that it can close and close those. But like I said, anything that the function is using, it's going to close over it, okay, and maintain a reference to it. So let's see what that doing to our, that's doing to our reference count. So when I call, when I create a variable bar in the global namespace, well, that's created as a reference count of one because it's just in the global namespace. And now when I pass it to foo, the reference count goes up to two, okay? But not really two, actually, it goes up by two to three. And the reason why is because you no know, foo have a reference to it and gu has a reference to it, in addition to the reference being held in the global namespace. Does that make sense? And so that's why x only have a reference count of two because it's inside of foo and it's inside of gu. But bar is in, in the global namespace, it's inside of foo, and it's inside of goo. And because goo wrapped around it in closed name, the reference comes went up to tree. If I did not pass or use, not pass, if I did not use name inside of goo, then the uh, reference count would remain two because it's just the global namespace and foo. If I passed it into goo, the reference count would have still gone up by one, okay? So by another additional one. So, all right. Now, when I call foo and I store the return value and I get a g as a reference to some function that was created and call goo, but I don't care about that name because a reference to it has been returned, it's stored in g. That function g, when invoked, will print out x and it would also print out bar because when that was created, it, had, it, it closed over name when it had the value or reference to bar. And you can see the same thing happening when I call foo a second time, but this time with tar variable. And of course you'd expect a reference to that energy to be stored in F and of course not be the same. And it is closing over the variable that was passed in at the time when I call foo, which was tar. And of course, that's how you see the reference count change that way. And you'll see the result as which I showed on the previous slide. Now, I appreciate all the viewership and um, I love you guys. Thanks for coming in and support me and watching my videos. I hope I'm able to teach you something and these have been illustrative. I have my own method way of teaching, um, as you've probably noticed. Um, there are other resources on the internet and I invite you to try those also. But if you really like the channel and you like what I'm doing, please, um, show your support by subscribing if you haven't subscribed already or um, if, you have, if you are subscribed Let your friends and family and whoever else know um, they can check it out too and ask them to subscribe. All right. Thanks. See you in the next video